-hmm. One, two. Okay. Once you log in, I'm gonna. Where is the restroom? Restroom is right over there, right here, right here. Oh. This one here. <clears throat> Good morning, Dimitri. <laughs> and there's Stefano. Boom. So I will be leaving audio and you can try it in the speakers. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um. I'm in there. One. Okay, so this is just a test. Looks good. Yeah, fantastic. Good morning. All right. Stefan, have you covered interest with uh, the people in theoretical physics? Yeah. Um, some, some, but um, mostly for not as much conditions, actually. Probably we should. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. For the weight of my cellophane, they have to be so permissible. In the same physics, right? The yeah, department. Do you have a book in Oxford? Sorry? Do you have a book in Oxford? Yeah, but it's the empirical phenomenon. Yeah. <laughs> it's nothing to do with one. Some class. So some of the some of the people are in materials, some of the people are in it's a bit complicated. Like the quantum people are spread across uh, hey. several departments in Oxford. Okay. I guess we shall get started. Ask somebody to say hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, can can anybody online just uh, say something so we can test that we can all hear you? Hello, one, two, three. Very nice. Thank you. And I think you have to start record. Did you already start recording? I think recording was already in progress. Remember? I did not. It says your screen share. Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. We're getting better. Thinking things. Okay. So some just uh, uh, again brief recap. Uh, some building blocks. There's some. Um, we have rotations. In fact, I'm going to make a small. Uh, oh, why? Interesting. 
uh yesterday we had a similar issue at the end yeah. right yeah you are right i don't know why people can see what's going on but yeah you're... does it look like you have mapped it yeah yeah, yeah it, it says it laptop so unless it got disconnected in some way who knows if i put a desktop does it come up as anything yeah okay, so okay. the desktop shows up so let's try laptop again try again come on See, Excellent. Turn okay. It turn it off and on again. The mantra. So if you just just uh, I'm going to start uh, looking at some calculations and I'm going to then move on to the double formalism. So the one that incorporates both probabilities and the Born rule. But first, just as a recap, uh, we saw Z rotations, which are in the form of Z spiders or empty spiders. And we saw X rotations, which are in the form of cross spiders or X spiders. And the normalization factors for these are already correct. They are already unitaries and there's no nothing more to do. Then there's the states zero and one. In fact, I'm going to put them here. There's the states zero and one, which are X spiders. That may be slightly surprising, but not too much because they are states on the equator for the x axis. So they are x spiders. And similarly, we have the states plus and minus, which are z spiders. Maybe I should put the alpha a bit on the side. There we go. And here I did cheat a little because I omitted the. I omitted the normalization factor. So I'm now going to introduce the normalization factors just to be clear. So there's a one over two. Let's see there's a one over two that technically has to go in front in order to make the normalized states. That's okay. And then something which I used but did not, did not necessarily explicitly talk about there's the outcomes of measurement. So there's the outcomes for the Z measurement, which are zero and one, but the bras this time, and they take the form of a spider with one leg coming in, the qubit, and apparently nothing coming out. But the reality is that that nothing that comes out is a complex number. And so really anything which doesn't have any legs in and any legs out, is going to be a complex number. And today we're going to see just some basic numbers that arise in the context of uh, qubits. And similarly, if I want to look at the, so this is the, if you will, taking these two together or writing B pi, something like this, for some binary bit. This is the same as talking about the outcomes for the Z basis measurement. Now on the other side, we can just change color and get the outcomes for the X basis measurements. We get the bras plus and minus, which correspond to spiders with, maybe I should have, good morning. Hopefully the rain wasn't too terrible. Um, spiders with one leg in, and nothing out because again they are just ways of producing scalars they're ways of producing numbers cool mm, and then we had some derived gates for example we saw the c naught and now i will point out that actually the c naught is has to be normalized so here is for your reference the c naught gate with the correct normalization factor. And similarly, the control Z or CZ. So this is a C naught, or if you want to be a bit more technical, it's a CX, so it's a control X gate. And then there's the control Z gate, which is very, very similar, but you apply to Hadamards and push them in, and it looks something like this. But again, it has a root two. And there's the Hadamard gate.
which changes between the two colors. So this is kind of a, it's a good summary of the various species that we've seen. And we've seen that they're spiders and of the two colors, but really for quantum computing, this is all you need typically, because most circuits are formed of controlled access, so control knots or CZs in, in case you want to do something a bit more uh, snazzy and then rotations, X and Z rotations and Hadamard and that's enough. It's enough to do everything. Now, how do you calculate things? So you have to know the names of some numbers. So amplitudes, simple ones, because you can express amplitudes. So it is a fact that you can express arbitrary complex numbers in the ZX calculus, but not all of them are common in quantum computing. So I'm going to show you the simple ones. Effectively, every diagram, which doesn't have any inputs and, or any outputs, but can possibly have a lot of different pieces inside and a lot of angles and a lot of wires. Uh, so something that has no inputs and no outputs is always going to be a complex number because it's a scalar for the underlying, if you want to be technical again, category. So it's a, if you want to get, identify these linear maps as matrices, then you can really think that the complex numbers are the matrices, the one by one matrices. Okay, so you can really imagine that a one by one matrix is just is just a number. It behaves as a number. It composes both ways with a one by one matrix. So, so it's a number. Uh, what are some useful numbers? Well, let's start with the easy ones. Uh, there is a trace. I can take the identity. So it's just a wire. And I can trace it. So I can close the loop with a cap and the cup. And I have to make it big because I want to distinguish it from the empty dot. This is the only situation where my choice of notation is going to annoy me because I'm going to have to tell you that this is one thing and this is a different thing. And they kind of look the same, but it's because secretly the one below should be colored with something and the one above is just wires. So I'm not entirely, maybe for this slide only, I will, I will use colors to distinguish the spiders. Just, just to make it extra clear. So um, let's start with this one. What is this? This is the trace of the identity matrix, the two by two identity matrix, because the part on the left, this one, is the two by two identity matrix. And the big thing going around is the trace. So you're just, actually, you know what? Let's do it properly. Is sum i equals zero one sum j equals zero one but I guess k is a better letter uh, of k k identity j j so it is the sum of k equals zero one delta j k squared. So it is just two. It's just a trace of identity. So that's one scalar that we learn to recognize. The dimension of the underlying space is a is a useful is a useful number to have. Then we learn to recognize some more scalars. Uh, if I have just a dot of either color, it doesn't really matter. But let's start with the with the Z one. And here again, I said I will fill it in for sake of extra, extra, extra clarity. This can be written as the inner product of two dots, which can be written as the inner product of zero plus one times zero plus one. So this is also the scalar 
to in fact it turns out that here it doesn't matter whether we distinguish between the the circle and and the dot they both give you the same scalar so they are different objects or different diagrams but even if you get confused in a calculation and you have a, a loop and you confuse it for an empty dot it it will give you the correct result anyway so it's it's okay it's not too bad no this is without that dot is never normalized i explicitly normalize thank you for that that point it allows me to clarify the definition of the plus state is the dot with the normalization added, added to it the dot itself is never normalized so really this is what i should have written the normalization is added to the dot it's not part of the dot and you cannot normalize the dot and the rotations at the same time uh, if you normalize one you unnormalize the other so a uh, good choice is to say the rotations are normalized because those are the most common applications of spiders and the dots themselves eh. you carry a factor of one over root two and for the c knots you carry a factor of root two instead and now we'll see what root two looks like uh similarly for the cross spider you get uh, analogous reasoning it gives you plus actually it just plus plus minus plus plus minus and it's again two. now the reason that i explicitly uh wrote this as an inner product is because it helps me deal with a slightly more general case because then I can make cosines pop out of the woods. Uh, so I get a new kind of scalar I want to deal with, which is the just just some angle. So it's the empty dot. At this point, there is no ambiguity anymore. This cannot be a loop of wire. There's an angle associated to it. And I can write this as alpha inner product with the uh, phaseless spider. So I can expand it again, and it becomes uh, zero plus one and on the other side i get zero plus e to the i alpha one so this is one plus e to the i alpha in particular i can take the pi dot which is one plus e to the i pi which is What's e to the i pi? It's minus one. So it's one minus one, which is zero. So there are some of these dots give you zero probabilities. They give you zero scalars. And it's it's correct because some of them are the inner products of orthogonal states. For example, this is the transition probability. And I will add the correct normalization here. This particular diagram is the transition probability from zero to one, sorry, from plus to minus, which is obviously zero because the two states are orthogonal, and it gives you one half times the zero dot. Okay, so you can, when you get these, these dots floating around and you get a pi, any pi dot kills everything else. So it's, it means at some point you took an inner product between two orthogonal states. Somehow. And then analogously, I can go to the plus, sorry, to the x dots, and I get same expression. And analogously, the pi x dot is zero. And here, perhaps it's worth putting a little slash across my zeros. So these are some useful, useful numbers. And now we get one final scalar that we uh, encounter frequently, which is the. the one from the bone law, as they call it. So it's the uh, inner product between the spider state of one color and the spider effect of the other color. So two spiders of different colors with one leg in between, not two. If you have two in between, then you get, just to remind you, because of like chopping or hop flop, these disconnect and you get the number four. But if you have only one leg in between, then you can write this as 
actually that's probably the easiest ways to at this point do it in the nah, let's do it explicitly so the bra is zero plus one the cat is plus plus minus and so we have four four terms that we want to that we want to compute is the inner product of zero and plus the inner product of one and plus the inner product of zero and minus and the inner product of one and minus and the reason i picked this particular order is that i wanted to have plus on the plus minus on the right so it's easy to just pick their components so the component here is one over root two this is one over root two this is one over root two and this is minus one over root two so you sum them uh, and you get one over two one over two one over two minus one over two and the result is square root of two yeah so it's two over two times one over square root of two which is square root of two so that's this particular number and so we get square roots out of it how do you choose because it should be alpha it would be one plus i alpha sorry so, give me a second so give me so i have a spider two spiders connected this one rule that should be before alpha yeah if i now follow the convention one plus two yeah but now if i follow your convention should i change the sum should i have e to the alpha in each when i do the adjunct because otherwise it should be e to the minus huh? <laughs> and there is a global part. of course it's a thing in the end in your notation because you're saying that i have not i think i don't think i've actually ever ever said explicitly what the so this i define to be one sorry zero wow uh, let's start again uh, zero plus e to the i alpha one yeah and this I define to be zero plus e to the i alpha one. That's 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 a convention. And Otherwise, it's not equivalent. The two rules are not equivalent. And you have to uh, indeed you have to observe that if you take the adjoint of this, you don't get the other. You get minus alpha. And the only cases that I've used so far happen to work out fine because they were either zero or pi. And then everything is okay, but yes, that's that's an excellent point. To, uh, let me write it down now that you are saying this. Yes, please, you can continue. Uh, this, yeah, 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 this, or the next one, okay. So, because you started saying that the states have the one over a square root of two, so when I am given plus, like for example, the last thing. Yeah. Why is that I do not put the factor one over square root of two? Uh, in sorry, let me. It, it can be interpreted in two ways. Which which like this one? For example, yeah. Why is that? Before you said that if you have you know mm. plus with a line. So again, there is a convention there. So I said this. Right. I said that this is defined to be this. Yeah. yeah, but but this is still defined to be this, and it's just that it it so work it works out that this is one over two zero plus one. So there is the convention that was the normalization convention that I was that I briefly mentioned. I pick my units and co-units to be not normalized so that they are they are the the sheer sum of the the shear sum of the base computational basis vectors, that's the unit or the co-unit for that particular structure. So I don't get normalization factors when I delete them. So this particular choice implies that if I take the zero state, which I will explicitly write like this, and I delete it, what I get is the bra zero plus the bra one composed with a cat zero, which gives me the number one. And that 
that for that to happen, I have to not normalize the unit. If I normalize the unit, it becomes the state plus, genuinely normalized. But then I, I get a scalar when I try to use it to cancel stuff. And then I have to adjust my equations, which is OK. But, uh, uh, so now, I, given, that, uh, given that you mentioned this, first let me write down explicitly the point you made about the adjoints so that we have them for future reference. Uh, so this is the adjoint of zero plus e to the i alpha one, which is bra zero plus e to the minus i alpha bra one which is the spider effect with minus alpha. And then the other point that I will want to make is that mm -hmm. the bialgebra law and the Hopf law have a normalization factor in them because we are copying states. So we have to be a bit careful. So let me, let me write how you derive that and then we'll, we'll write it down explicitly. So here you wanna say that if you have the state uh, what you effectively what you're going to say, what you want to say is that if you copy a state and then add the two copies in the group, so modulo two, you always get the zero state. So the idea is if you plug zero in here and you get zero, actually, if you plug B in here and you get B, B, and then you add the two copies, you get B, X or B which is always just zero. And so you say this is the same as taking B, deleting it, getting the scalar one, and then producing the state zero, regardless of what the input was. And now, of course, uh, there is a, there's a problem here. Uh, I now know that the dot on the right, the cross spider with one leg coming out is not the state zero. A cross spider with one leg coming out is, is the state zero without the normalization factor. So I have to add a normalization factor there. And here on the left, when I add the two, the two states, I also don't get the state zero. What happens is if I plug, uh, if I really take B, so let's say A pi and B pi, and these are all small things, but they matter. Uh, what I get is a pi, b pi is x or b pi. And that's fine, except that what I want on the right is the state x or b. So I want to get this. And what I want to start with is the states, the normalized states, uh, a and b. So I want to do this on the actual computational basis, the normalized one. And so I can't... I can't genuinely do it unless I introduce the normalization factors that I need. And so I get one over two, one over two here and here. And that tells me that really the part at the top in the hop, in the hop flaw, even if I plug in a normalized state and I take two copies, there's a factor that gets introduced somewhere there. The multiplication that I'm looking for is if I just want to do it with the, uh, um, has, a, has some normalization issue, really. So if I plug into this, what I will get is I'll get root two. So here I have to add one over root two as well, technically, for this to work. Uh, so that's a, because uh, then I get B, two copies of B, uh, two copies of B give me one over two, one over two, give you one single copy. Uh, actually, that's yeah, that's fine. It's enough to introduce them. Right? I think that's okay, right? One, two, two. Uh, two, two, two. Give me one over two, one over two. Give. Sorry, I made a mess with this. Let me start back. This is correct as it is, but that's not what I want. What I get on the right. My apologies, I clearly the coffee. Uh, that's what, that's, this is what happens, but it's not really with A and B. This is root to A, this is root to B, this is root to A, X or B. So that's fusion, that's just fusion. And that's, I don't know why I introduced the scalars there. I shouldn't have. What happens at the top is that I plug in this state 
d pi, which has a normalization factor in the front. And I copy it and I do get two copies because that's the, that's the copy law. And there's a normalization factor there that makes everything works fine. So I get d pi, d pi, and then I add them. And fusion tells me that I get my desired state with an extra factor of one over two that kind of hangs hangs in the balance. So I want to cancel out the factor of one over root two. I want to remove it from the from the uh, equation. So I should put a root two in front. In fact, you can, if you want, you can say that the, the XOR, the actual map that does the XOR is this one. That is the XOR. That's the XOR with the correct normalization factor. Uh, and indeed that's why if you go to the, to the C naught, there's a root two there. The root two is is because you're trying to do a copy plus XOR, and XOR is has to be normalized because otherwise you lose a factor. Uh, there's a different version where you don't have to care about all of these normalization factors, but your the states of one basis are not normalized. So that's a different convention that one can pick. That's the one I picked when I wrote my thesis because I couldn't be bothered to have all of these scalars flying around. But if you read any any uh, text on the ZX calculus, they all tell you that this is the convention they use. So let, I'm going to stick with that, but only for a second. Uh, all right. So a couple more scalars, a couple more things that I, that I care about. Uh, now that I know that the XOR is really normalized, I want to have this, which is the actual hop flaw. I want to have this, which is the actual bialgebra law or the actual leg chopping and square popping laws. So they carry, they come with a factor of root two. And the actual copy laws. That's going to be in the actual deletion law. In fact, for this last one, I'm going to really want to explicitly write it down. It's going to be zero plus one times B, which is going to be obviously one. And so now we'll get one more scalar out of things. Um, this is... Uh, this implies that if I have the bone, the bone is root two. So same result as before. And the copy law for your complete reference looks like this. So it, it genuinely sends the state B to the state BB because it is an isometry. So these are just conventions for the normalization factors. I think the easier way to remember all of them is to just say whenever the copy is a copy it's an isometry whenever you want to do XOR on the computational basis you do this this is the important one you just remember you add a factor of root two wherever you have XOR and that that tells you that gives you the right results uh, so okay now with a bunch of uh, uh, scalars at hand let's let's get a one more trick under our belt um You want to do yeah. like this. Like this. You can do that. Um, that's no, 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 no. You can, but I'm saying in me, in my mind, it looks easier. Now you're saying the normalization. The normalization is. I mean, I I understand that part of the thing with the normalization is that when you fuse many times, is a big pain. 
Okay, I understand that. But you could keep track of certain numbers, as you're saying, one over two over two over here, with how many of those have. So if you have 35 fusions, you put an N that is 35. And you know, at the very end, you put everything normalized. And at the very end, you take all these numbers, how many times they were repeated, and you get the final amplitude. You don't even have to keep track of the numbers in the end. If you yeah, let's assume that if you want to, if you compute all of the amplitudes of a measurement, for example, then you don't even have to keep track. I wanted to show it on the yeah. next slide because you can just compute all of them and then sum them and use the sum to, to be normalized. Because the entire diagram will have the same number of, regardless of what you plug at the end, is going to have the same number of factors missing from it, exactly. and so you can normalize at the very end. Which is which is what people do in practice. The only problem is if you want to compute a single amplitude. Mm -hmm. If you have a big diagram and you're not trying to measure and compute the outcomes of a measurement, but you have one uh, one amplitude you want to compute, only one. Yeah. And then you have to keep track of things because you don't have anything to normalize against. You don't know that it's a circuit, so it's normalized in any way. But I mean, this idea of just following the integer cannot help. Because suppose I have, I want to, yeah, I understand. You want to measure some one cubic out of 10. Fine. But if I pull up this square root, it's a big thing, and I have to follow all the square root of two. Mm -hmm. It's a big thing. It's very hard to follow. Yeah, so that's. That's why that's why nobody does it. That was exactly. that was about to be my point. Is like nobody cares about these all of these factors. We just. If you want to calculate, suppose I can focus on. You can put a different, you can just put a correct. You can, these are multiplicative. So all you have to do is put numbers plus ones and minus ones and keep some of them somewhere. And that's it. Because they're always multiple of root two, right? Right, right, so, right, right. right. So, that's right, that's right. But what I'm saying is if what you do in practice, in practice, if you can many of these things, you write all the square root of two or you put some, no. We don't even, we don't even write. We just do this and then at the end we, you know what? Let's just do that. Let's let's calculate something. Uh, I'm gonna take the bell state. I'm gonna take this state. I'm gonna start with plus, and I'm going to not not put any normalization because I wouldn't anyway. Uh, and I'm going to calculate the outcomes of a z basis measurement on the bell state. So that's uh, that's the best thing. You start with the state zero zero. You apply a. You get to the state plus zero. Then you apply a C naught. You get to the state the bell state five plus, and then you measure it. So this is the Z Z measurement. Well, Z measurement in either in in both cubes. So what does this give you? Well, you can first of all color change. The first spider so that you take away the Hadamard. Then you can fuse. Then you can remove, you can use the fact that these are the identity. They don't have any phase. So you're left with something like this. And then you're given a XOR B pi. Uh, I guess you know what the XOR will up will. There is no meaning to a XOR B pi, so I'm going to drop the parentheses. And now a XOR B pi is one or zero. In fact, it is not one or zero, but it is two or zero. It's two. Uh, if a or b is zero, and it is zero if a or b is one, so we get the probabilities for the outcomes that come to zero 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 one one zero one one, and we have that zero zero has probability quote unquote of course two, then zero, then two, then zero, and this looks weird but it's because we didn't bother normalizing so we do the probability of zero zero is two over two plus zero plus two plus zero 
the probability of zero one is zero over two plus zero plus two plus zero. So this is one half, this is zero and so on. So we just normalize afterwards. We just take the a histogram or a, an unnormalized distribution and we divide by its sum and that's it. And we never have to care about any of the, any of the scalars that come about. So that's, that's typically what people do. People don't bother with all of the root twos, but yeah. yeah suppose you don't measure the last the five. So the one down there, you do not measure. So you have A pi. But not B pi. pi. Not there, nothing. Doesn't matter, you get an unnormalized state. Uh, yeah, but that's fine. So you want you don't, no B pi? No. No B pi. So this becomes this. Yes. And at that point, you get the correct state without even having to bother with, because you bother with normalization only at the end. You, any, any state can be always normalized in a unique way. So you don't actually have to bother with, with normalizing it. So you get that it's A pi. So it's either, it's the state A, up normalization. Because every quantum state can be normalized in a unique way, and up in, except the zero vector. But every other quantum state has one normalization factor. So it doesn't really matter. You think of it projectively and you don't care until you need the actual probabilities and then you care. But you only care at the very end. Until you get to the very end, you don't, you don't need to know what the, unless you want to compute the probability of that measurement outcome. And there, that's the point where you need to carry the factor. So if you want to ask the question, what is the probability of getting A in here? then well that's just the norm of the remaining state but you cannot you have to normalize it against that, the yeah suppose <laughs> there we go yeah that's what i was thinking suppose you want to know what is that probability so that probability it's no nah, it's not luckily it isn't and i'm going to intentionally use diagrams A pi this over uh, did I do it right? That's the norm of that state. Plus A pi over what for? Uh, That surely isn't right. Nah, you're right. But it shouldn't be. Hang on. No, no, no. You're you're correct. Uh, but there is something. I am missing something here. Ah, yeah, no. Sorry. It's zero. It's two a pi. Correct. So it's zero. I was like, what? This is like nonsense. This makes no sense. That state is not the zero state. Um, so this is two over four, which is one half. So you can do that. Yeah. Because it's the norm of the marginal state that gives you the probability. So you, if you have all the outcomes of one measurement, you take all the outcomes of any partial measurement even, and you sum the norms of the corresponding marginals, and you take the norm of the marginal you want, that gives you the probability for the outcome. So you never need to carry scalars, really. Unless you want to, the only case where you don't want to carry scale, where you want to carry the scalars is when you have uh, 30 qubits and you want the probability of one measurement. And you don't want to sum two to the 30 terms. Then you, then you need to carry around some, some, you do some bookkeeping, yes. But very often you don't care. So for example, for circuit simplification purposes, you don't need to do that. Because you, yeah, anywhere you simplify the circuit, you know that you want the final circuit to still be unitary. So there's only one normalization factor that will give you the correct, the correct probability. Uh, thinking, for example, you know, the power of one period, the respect of one period and the respect of one solution in one single period. Mm. Then that is controlled for, you know, the whole system is can control unitary. Yeah. Uh, they control unitary, just say it is thousand periods. Yeah. But you only want one measurement outcome. Then you do get only two terms to sum over. You get yeah, it. Like you have to sum all the others. I mean, no. 
because you take uh, first let me just check that i have understood what you what you're saying and then we'll take from there so you say there is a a big control circuit i have one measurement we have some starting states let's say zeros for sake of and then you get a thousand qubits here that are left something like that okay and you want to ask what is the probability of getting the outcome b you want the probability of b and there what you do is you take that circuit and it's adjoint you simplify them however you want And then you sum over, so let's call this U, and this is U dagger, uh, and you sum over the the two possibilities because you only have two measurement two measurement outcomes. There is no issue with the it's only the problem only when you have of measurements. Correct, and you want correct, and moreover, when you're not trying to do where you're trying to do a strong simulation. So when you're trying to sample, when you're trying to efficiently sample measurement outcomes or just compute one probability, because if you're trying to, if you have many measurements and you want to compute the probabilities of all outcomes, so you want the full distribution, then again, you still have to do the full computation. So you might as well do that. So the only problem you have is when you either want to sample from a circuit, but that's, that's known to be hard anyway, or when you want to compute the probability of a single outcome, let's say you're interested only in the case where the, all the qubits are zero where the outcomes are all zeros. You only want to know the probability of that, and you have 30 qubits, then this, this method has, then you might as well carry around the phases because that's like the normalization factors, because that's a lot less, that's a lot less problematic than having to compute two to the 30 circuit reductions. Yes, yes, that is, uh, yeah. Uh, what is the probability of your question? Tell me. Um, could you, uh, could you show I, I can, but I will like categorically refuse to do that. Um, the yeah, you can, but but I don't want to. It's it's not a particularly nice algorithm, and it's better to do it in ZH than in ZX because it's one of these Boolean circuit algorithms. Uh, it doesn't give you much of an additional insight because the most of what Shore does is these modular exponentiations and the discrete Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform is, you can study it in its own right. And there are variants of the ZX calculus that give you some insight as to that. But other than effectively saying you're doing the calculation of Shor's algorithm, it doesn't give you much of an insight. It's not a, a Simon's problem is small enough that you can that you can tackle it and understand what's going on by using the ZH calculus. So this is the find uh, there are exactly the, my function is is the same on exactly two. Uh, I have hidden a bit string into my into my function such that I, the function is constant over any bit string sword any bit string and the bit string sword with my secret bit string find a secret bit string. That's Simon's problem. It's the one maybe the first problem that demonstrated. Uh, oracular separation between quantum complexity classes and classical complexity classes oracular of course not uh, not a full separation yes or or mermin's no locality argument or so we can look at mermin's no locality argument for example for calculations um, which leads me to introduce to make a point which is here in order to compute a probability i had to double something which is a bit annoying because I now have to carry this giant. This is the Born rule, right? The Born rule says if you want to compute the if you want to compute the probability of an outcome of a single outcome or any number of outcomes, uh, you take the you take your original circuit with all of your measurements and all of the open wires that it may have. You take the adjoint of that,
and this is the probability up to up to normalization. Because it's now doubled. Because this one is this gives you the probability, the amplitude alpha. This gives you alpha dagger. So it's the so it's the square norm. The overall thing is the square norm of this. Well, uh, this is a complex number, so whatever uh, alpha squared, which is the probability. So this is the Born rule. And it would be good if we could carry around information about the fact that our circuits, when we want to compute probabilities, are secretly doubled. At some point, we're going to have to double them. Now, we can still do all of our computations without doubling them explicitly, because it would be annoying to have to apply the C0 on one side and the C0 on the other side. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's just bad bookkeeping. So we can do that until we have to start making partial traces or doing measurements, and then we have to sort of merge them. So there's a, a construction which is called the CPM or doubled construction. So doubled uh, ZX, where instead of having, you go from a single linear map. So this is uh, a C linear map and you double it. So you imagine that you have, you always carry around the map together with its conjugate. And that's the same as saying, for example, that instead of having the state zero, you carry around the density matrix zero, zero. Instead of carrying around the, uh, yeah, okay, the bra uh, zero, you carry around the weird thingy, which the bra, where the bra zero is applied to something. So you carry around the CP map with the bra zero as its only cross operator. So you have states, go to density matrices, so state uh, bra goes to density matrix, goes to cross operator, and more generally, a linear map U goes to, again, the CP map with just one cross operator. And this is a linear map of any kind, but you don't want to, you don't want to explicitly carry any of this around. You don't want to actually write the two diagrams, as I said, that is incredibly annoying. So what you do is you develop a new notation and you say, when I write a box of any kind, and I write it double, so with thick, you can write double or you can write with thick, uh, with thick uh, wires. If you have a, if you are typesetting, you can use thick wires, but if you're writing by hand, you typically write doubled. Um, and this means having the two maps, U and U dagger, sorry, U and U star. So the map and its conjugate and carrying them around so that the wires Come in pairs. So the first wire, I'm going to keep the wires of U well aligned and I'm going to bend the ones for U star. So it's something like this. It's just a very big bookkeeping operation, really. And it's because working with tensors, working with CP maps as tensors is a bit annoying, typically. So what you do is you say, I, I imagine that actually everything is double. There are, there are two directions and uh, I work with effectively the Bohr rule incorporated into my, into my formalism. And the advantage of that is now the scalars, the scalars, actually let's say the uh, states are now density matrices, like up to normalization again. And up to normalization, so really positive emission maps. The uh, the maps, so the boxes in general are completely positive maps. The scalars, so the numbers, are now 
the pos the non-negative reals, which is good because we can now compute probabilities, not just amplitudes. So we lose the we lose the power to look at amplitudes, but we gain the power of automatically computing probabilities. And so we can, for example, look at our uh, at our uh, ingredients, and we can add some more ingredients to this. We can, for example, add the discarding map, which is defined to be just the cap, but opened up. So you take the two wires, you keep the two wires together, and then you should just apply a cap at the end, like that. Uh, let's just do it. That's the discarding map. Why is it the discarding map? Because if I apply it to a state, so let me take the state zero for now without normalization, and I discard it. What this diagram means is that I have two versions of zero, and I connect them with a cap, which is the same as taking the inner product. So it's a way of packaging away the Born rule. So this is called the discarding map, but you might know it better as the partial trace. AKA the partial trace. And for example, if I wanted to do the, I'm going to take a slightly more complicated example, which is the R state. So a state in the Y basis, which has the advantage of not being self conjugate. Uh, and I discard it. What, what does it open up to? It is the R state. What's the conjugate of the R state? The L state. Because if I take zero plus I one, one over two, and I, Conjugate it, not dagger, just conjugate. You get one over two, zero minus i one. So if this in the inside was the r state, this on the right is the l state. So what I get is r and uh, r and l, which is kind of what I want, connected by connected by this. Uh, but then I have to transpose one of them and it sort of straightens up to be R cat R bra and it gives me one because the transpose unconjugates things. So the point really is the observation that if you have a map U and you take its star and so if you have a state, you have a state psi of however many qubits you want and you take the conjugate of the state and then you transpose the state, then what you get is the adjoint of the state because transpose, conjugate transpose is adjoint. Right? So this is the conjugate transpose plus transpose. So that's the, uh, so why is this? Why is this a good, a good notation? Well, if you look at CP maps, CPTB maps or CP maps in general, it's kind of hard to write them as a single operator. Typically, CP maps are written as cross operators. So you write the trace. You can't really write it as a, you can't really write it as a single matrix. It's it's hard to write it as a single matrix. It, this is the partial trace, uh, uh, which is you have to sort of say, okay, it's, this, it's the map that sends rho to the sum over uh, B equals zero one of B rho B, that. Mm. It's a bit annoying. It's very hard to imagine that when you compose these maps, so even if you take U, U star, V, V star, let me use a slightly sharper V, scalpel, then this particular map is going to be the map that sends rho to v u rho u dagger v dagger. And that's very annoying to write. It's, it's hard to, especially when you have sums involved, it becomes hard to keep track of things. So if you instead package it this way, you recover this nice compositional, so this nice sequential compositional structure. without having to remember that these secretly telescopes. So the idea is if you try to write this particular thing on the left in diagrams, it would have to look something like V dagger, 
you dagger blank you v and some people have developed uh, have developed diagrammatic notations for this particular way of telescoping telescoping maps but it's kind of annoying so instead you you bend the you bend one side around and you just so you bend this side around and you say ah no okay my state is really going to have two parts that go from they go like that and so instead i write my state row as two pieces and on one side i have uv and on the other side i have u star v star and then i hide all of that into my notation for as long as i possibly can so i only open things up when i really 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 have to but not before and so a few more ingredients um what's the measurement so how do i measure if i have if i start with a state uh a state psi and i want to perform a, an x measurement a z measurement let's say that is the same as testing against the testing against zero and this is going to be the probability of zero and the probability of one is going to be testing against one but double right so this is because if i open this up i get the bone rule i get phi sorry psi zero psi star zero which is psi zero sorry psi zero zero psi dagger and similarly here i get psi without the star psi one psi star one which is the same as if i rotate it uh, psi one one psi sorry psi dagger so the adjoint and this is just the square norm of zero psi and this is just a square norm of one psi so i want to somehow carry around these double zeros and ones but without having to active actively write them as doubled and so the easy way to do it is to do a copy right i want to get from a single zero and one to two that i can then compose into my states to get my probabilities so i just put a copy map there but a copy map that goes the other way and so i get measurements in the z basis the measurement in the z basis looks something like this where i now have two kinds of wire i have the doubled wire and i have the singled wire and the double wire means that i have a quantum system and the single wire means that i have a classical system and so this gives me the way, a way to talk about quantum systems and classical systems and i have to be a bit careful in this wire to only plug this or this or their linear combination so i have to only plug things that are in the z basis effectively that's the secret uh, that's part of the secret sauce underneath that we can talk about in the afternoon if you really want uh but for now it's it's about sister algebras and stuff like that but for now just think you want to compute the probabilities of zero and one so you have zero the bra and one the bra and he, what happens is if you plug them if you plug zero in here you get the doubled zero sorry you get let's say zero zero because zero star is zero which is just the double zero so you get the correct thing and similarly if you plug one in this you get the doubled one so you get the quantum one if you want and you just so this zero here is the classical zero bit value and this zero here is the quantum zero bra so there are different things now you have single wires double wires single wires is classical stuff doubled wires is quantum stuff and this is very handy because it makes it easy to compute the probabilities of things probability distributions without having to in introduce these b's and these variables that stand for measurement outcomes i can just write what it means to measure a state so as an example i'm going to take uh the following state i'm going to 
hopefully I'm gonna get it right. And if I don't get it right, I will get it right. Um, so hang on that, yes. So I wanna start with, not with the right pen. So I'm gonna create this thing. And then I'm gonna simplify it a little. So I'm gonna apply a C naught here. In fact, you know what? I'm going to use a thick pen because I have a thick pen. That's too thick. Excellent. Does anybody know what this state looks like? It's a GHC, yeah, it's a GHC state, but in the bong basis, in the X basis rather than the Z basis. Uh, and then I want to put some measurements here and some rotations actually. Uh, again, in the correct basis. And then I want to perform some measurements. And the measurements are the ones that will have the thin out like that. And these, uh, I want to, in fact, let me take this to be my thick pen and my usual to be the thick pen. And these can be either zero or uh, pi over two. So I'm gonna say this is Alice, times pi over two, Bob, pi over two, Charlie, pi over two. And what I get out is uh, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. So I want to start with this state. In fact, I will take it and I will move it to the center of my screen and I will do my simplification in successive slides. And now I take this. Uh, this is going to be the story of Mermin, Mermin's non-locality argument, which is, if you've never seen it, probably the single most compelling piece of evidence for the fact that quantum is not classic because you don't have to do any weird probability hocus pocus. You don't have to say, oh, this is the maximum correlation that I can get. Here is a very long argument why. That's unfair, Bell. Bell's argument is, is really cool. But it, it relies on a specific, on exceeding a specific bound, by the way, exceeding it by very, very small amounts. Uh, this one doesn't rely on any bounds. It's just, a, it's a binary logical fact. It's a deterministic argument. You either get zero or one and you get the wrong value and that's it. So this is Mermin's non-locality argument. And you start with the state. And the first thing that you can do is you can fuse, right? So I can, I observe that I can fuse this there, this there, and I can fuse this there. And I can probably also at some point use some other stuff, but let's start with that. So fusion is the first thing that I can do, the first step. And the result of fusion is that I no longer have one, two, three, that's it. And then I observed that actually this and this are just legs that do nothing. There's no rotation there. So I can simplify them and I get just two legs, just two bends like that. So then I hope that the thick wire and the thin wire are sufficiently well distinguished. They seem to be pretty, I mean, to my eye, they are quite, quite distinguished. Um, and then I observe that I can fuse this and this and this. So three, fusion again. So this would have been two. So three, I can fuse all of these things because they're all spiders that touch, they're all in the same basis. And so I get to one big clump, And that's going to be a GHC spider. One, two, three. And this, the phase on the spider is going to be A plus B plus C times pi over two. And now this, I, it looks like I can't do much about it. 
it looks like I am I'm kind of done with the simplifications I can I can do. And here's where the nice tricks come. Now you look at this and you're like, what do I do? If you're one of our students, you're, you stare at it and think I, I have no more intuition other than trying to plug something and see what comes out. No, 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 no. You have something to do. You can undouble it. So you take this and you say, I, actually this entire notation, the entire point of having this notation was to hide away the fact that this diagram was more complicated. And perhaps if I open it up, then this diagram will become simple again. And so I open it up into its constituents. And I say that this is really two different, uh, it's a double spider and there are three, in fact, I guess I can, let me do something first. So you, because I know where I'm going, I'm going to first take out the phase just cause I, kind of foresee what's happening. Actually, you know what? No, this is not very, this is not very didactical. It's not very instructive. Okay, you look at that, you open it up and you're like, okay, so I get doubled and I have some, let, I'm going to define alpha to be A plus B plus C, five or two, just to avoid having to carry it around. So this is alpha, this is minus alpha. And I have three dots here which are the measurements and my spiders are connected to all three like that. And now I look at it and I observe that this thing here is kind of a K to three. I have X spiders on one side, Z spiders on the other side and they're fully connected. So probably square popping. But I can't yet do it. I really have to pull out the phases first. So this I want to delete. How do I delete it? Maybe if I press my finger on it. I want to take this and I want to move it around a little. So I first things first, I pull out the two the two phases and then I get truly a K to three, which I square pop. And I'm left with the two phases and this and this. So I, I swap the two, I swap the two. And then I consider the cases where alpha is equal to either zero or pi. I restrict myself to these situations. I ignore the case where all three picked, where the number of people who picked pi over two is odd. So I restrict myself to some situations. And what I get is that pi pi, and now this becomes easier, is equal to just one pi, co-copied, co-multiplied, and it's this classical spider here. Now, what is that spider? I don't know. That's a random. That's a random number. That's not something that I necessarily that I necessarily know how to deal with. But I can take my original, my original scenario, and I'm almost done with it. I can now say, actually, this scenario I'm going to post-process a little. I'm going to say the these three people. First of all, I restrict, uh, imp I impose or I restrict to the cases where. Um, there's Alice, Bob, and Charlie. They pick a byte each, sorry, a bit each. And I restrict to the cases where or to when A plus B plus C is equal to uh, either zero or two, so that I get either zero or pi as my angle. So things are nice. But I also say at the end of this particular experiment, they take their three outcomes and they do something to them, they XOR them. So I go from some probability distribution, I want to get a number, just a single number, one thing that tells me what's happening. So they just classically post-process their outcomes. And now I have the language to talk about both classical and quantum stuff. So this is a classical XOR. 
because it has thin wires, single wires. So this is a classical XOR of the three outcome, outcomes. And so I take my this, it becomes, we've seen already the entire thing disappears. And becomes a state which takes this form. And so I have, and do the calculation, I take my outcome distribution, which is random. And then I saw all of its legs. And what I get is, in fact, that's either, I guess it's a pi, is zero or pi, I should have said it's, uh, was it d pi, let's say. Um, and if they are zero, then d is equal to zero. And if they are two, then d is equal to one. That's what I want. So I get either zero or pi, and I get a single outcome. There is a single classical outcome that I get, either zero or one. And this is uh, either the zero or one outcome, deterministically zero if uh, they all picked uh, zero. And one if A plus B plus, if two of them picked one and one of them picked zero. And so I can tabulate the outcomes and I will conclude. And tomorrow we can, or this afternoon, we can go over why this is relevant. And I'm going to say, okay, when they, I have Alice, Bob, and Charlie, they make three choices. And I'm only considering four cases, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. And there are two outcomes that I can get. I can either get zero, so I say out. I can either get zero or one. And now it, it will turn out that if you try to reason about this classically and say, my outcomes were predetermined and I cannot, I can, so there is some, there is some model, I, something I don't know. And the randomness comes from my ignorance of the small state of the universe. Uh, there's some perturbation of the air around me while I do the experiment that determines whether it's zero or one. It turns out it, it doesn't work. And so what I'll do this afternoon is I'll introduce you to some more of these, some of the non-locality stuff uh, and some of the probabilistic sort of reasoning stuff. And I'm going to show you the completion of this argument. So this is just the calculation part of the argument. You demonstrate that if you take a protocol and this is the full Mermin argument, you can write it in the ZX calculus using these doubled and singled wires to distinguish between quantum and classical systems. And you do part of your reasoning, the first part, you do it purely in the doubled wires. You don't need to look into the doubled wires at any point there. You, can, you know how to do fusion, you know how to uh, copy things, you know, you know all of this stuff. And then only when you exhaust your options in the quantum side of things, you open up your diagram into the doubled version. So you apply the Born rule, if you will. And then by applying the Born rule, you get more things that you can do because now your diagram has more pieces typically something like by algebra or sorry, the square popping applies. And then you continue calculating and typically what you get out of it is either something which is again doubled so you can repackage it or you get something which is purely classical. And so you just have a classical answer at the end. In this case, my outcome only had classical wires coming out of it. So I get a classical probability distribution, uh, but I don't want to know about what the probabilities are even though I could have easily computed them. Uh, I just want to say, okay, maybe there's something I can do to the classical stuff to make it even simpler. So I can post-process it. And that's exactly how the argument goes. You say, actually, I don't need to know the distribution because if I do the right post-processing, the distribution becomes deterministic. I either get always zero or always one. And then the next part of the argument will be, okay, what does this actually mean in terms of whether quantum theory can be explained classically? And the answer is going to be, unless you believe in some interesting things. Um, it can't, but that's for the afternoon. I think we are done. The morning part was the calculation part. So this should be good. And we can all go and uh, have a donut. Yes, do you have questions?
No, I presume. And see you at two this afternoon.